Hi, welcome back to WebRTC Tips by WebRTC Ventures. I'm Aaron Syme, CEO and founder of WebRTC Ventures. And today I want to talk to you about some application trends that we're seeing for WebRTC applications in 2021. We're recording this in early January of 2021. And uh, so we've certainly learned a lot in the last year. Uh, unfortunately, the year 2020 was truly awful for um, so many reasons. Uh, but one small silver lining in that was how live video and WebRTC specifically as a live video standard in the browsers was able to help us get through the awfulness that was 2020 as best as we could. So now into 2021 and, and looking at the rest of this year and even beyond that, I think we can say that 2021 is going to be less awful than 2020. It's not going to be uh, back to normal, but I do think it's certainly going to be less awful than 2020 was. Uh, we have the vaccines starting to roll out. It's going to take time for those to roll out globally, uh, but at least over the course of this year that will happen. So some of us will be going back to school in the office, uh, but many of us are going to choose to stay home anyways, uh, even once we have the, the ability to go back to the school or the office. And uh, similar with events and conferences, maybe in the second half of this year, uh, we'll start to see events and conferences coming back in person, but uh, probably not until 2022, really, uh, in most cases. So those are some assumptions that we're making in these uh, trends and these predictions that we're seeing. So I've got a half a dozen trends that I want to go through with you here quickly. Uh, the first is that uh, because events and conferences are not coming back, uh, to a fully in-person mode anytime soon, the continued combination of using WebRTC for live video as well as broadcast technologies is going to continue to grow, continue to be an important trend in WebRTC application development. And that will be driven uh, even beyond 2021, even after the pandemic ends, by the concept of hybrid events. So once we can get back to in-person events, many of us will go. The in-person event, the in-person conference experience, the in-person concert experience, it's just too compelling. And in, and in the business context of a context of a conference, uh, we haven't figured out a way to uh, really replace that professional networking that you get uh, when you're uh, in person at a conference. It's really tough to do virtually. Nobody's figured that out yet, unless maybe you do. Uh, and we'd be happy to help you build that if you've got that solution. But when these events come back and we can go back in person, they're still going to stay uh, hybrid for many participants, both the attendees as well as presenters at conferences. We can expect more and more hybrid events where some of the attendees are in person, others are remote. Most of the presenters will want to be in person, but some will need to join remotely and that's gonna become more and more common. So when you're, when you're at a conference, you're gonna see it sort of like this sketch on the screen here where you have in-person presenters and then others up on the screen. And also we need to think about how do we engage those remote attendees to be able to ask questions and stuff just as if they were in the audience. So maybe they're projected up on the screen too and able to ask questions via web or TC connection. And then in terms of broadcasting that event out to others, we'd expect uh, certainly uh, using things like YouTube and H traditional, more traditional techniques like HLS streaming will remain common, but if you really want to have interactivity with those remote guests, uh, and remote, remote participants being able to ask questions live and not be affected by the delays that an HLS connection introduces, uh, for that reason, I think we'll certainly see continued growth in the use of more real-time broadcast technologies like Millicast and Phoenix Offer in this sort of setting. Now the next trend, this is one I, I don't really like very much, unfortunately, but I do think it's a reality, uh, at least here in the United States anyways, that uh, telehealth is going to experience a technology consolidation. Uh, and the uh, certainly telehealth has been a uh, bright spot, uh, I guess you could say, <laughs> um, 
in, in the sense that uh, prior to the pandemic, people in healthcare were very skeptical of the concept of telehealth in general. That skepticism is gone now. Uh, we have seen certainly as a culture that it can work and that there are many scenarios where it's beneficial to have a telehealth visit than it is to go into a clinic in person. And I think even past the pandemic, that's gonna stay to a degree. So, so telehealth is here to stay. However, from a technology perspective, I think one of the problems is that the healthcare industry is um, very risk averse for understandable reasons, but from a technology perspective, what that means is that they tend to uh, consolidate around the most boring technologies. And so the old business adage of you'll never get fired for buying IBM applies in healthcare certainly where you're not necessarily going to pick the best solution, you're not necessarily going to pick the most innovative solution, you're often not going to pick the solution that's easiest to use for doctors or patients, instead you're gonna pick whatever solution the healthcare conglomerate you work for tells you you have to use. And that's gonna to tend to be things that are one size fits all, that don't have great workflows, that are not easy to use. And so unfortunately, I do think that that sort of consolidation, at least for the larger medical systems and the, and the many clinics that are associated with them, uh, is, is going to be true that we'll see this consolidation and, um, towards kind of boring, not great solutions. And I think that's unfortunate because there's so much opportunity in healthcare to really improve the patient experience. But I don't think all of the predictions there are, are, are bad. Well, I do think we'll see a consolidation of telehealth software in the largest players in healthcare. I think there are still plenty of situations where a more consumer-driven telehealth uh, solution can provide more innovative workflows. And so that's the next trend that we're seeing is that although the vast majority of patient situations will be done on a few particular technologies driven by the hospital system or whatever that they're working with. Um, there are still going to be many other opportunities that as telehealth entrepreneurs you can look for where there is an opportunity to provide a more custom solution, a better solution for delivery of care in a telehealth setting and better for both the doctors and the patients. And so I think when we think about like a direct to consumer market, in telehealth, that will tend to be dominated by, by players like Teladoc um, and brands that, that patients can uh, remember when they go to Google search a provider that they need if they don't you know, have their own provider already. However, there are lots of different um, patient care use cases and unique markets that could still benefit from a more custom application. And uh, so I think that uh, checking that out is, uh, thinking about those use cases is really important. There's a few different ways, uh, if you're a telehealth entrepreneur, that I would think about ways there is still going to be room for improvement and for custom applications in healthcare. One is uh, targeting of uh, certain regions. So, you know, a lot of my experience is, is in the US where I'm from, and so a lot of my skepticism about the uh, consolidation of telehealth is based on the experience here in the US market. In other countries, that may not be true. There may not be that same sort of consolidation. And so if you have access and connections in those regions, then perhaps there is still an opportunity for a really innovative telehealth care solution there. Or maybe even a sub-region within, you know, even within the US if you have the connections there to deliver it there. But beyond that, I think the best opportunities are to target particular uh, medical conditions or patient demographics. So in, in terms of a, a medical condition, one example that I think of is uh, like organ donor lists, for example. Uh, people who are waiting to receive an organ often require regular visits with medical providers to make sure that they're still healthy enough to receive that donation when one becomes available. And depending on the type of organ, dona uh, organ donor scenario, it may be also that the, the donor needs to regularly meet before they donate with the provider uh, that organ. So that sort of visit where you don't necessarily have to be in person, but you do need frequent interaction, uh, and it's around a, around a very specific use case, uh, might be a great example of how you can really manage that whole donor waiting list and build video into it in order to have those regular consultations with the patients involved. 
when we think about targeting patient demographics, an example I think of there is uh, a mental health care crisis on college campuses. So coming up with solutions that will be appealing to that college student demographic who's looking for mental health help and appealing to them directly. So having a solution that is not the one size fits all telehealth solution that's the same thing that uh, you know their grandparents are gonna use for a well visit, but something that's really tailored to their experience as a college student and provides other value even beyond simply the uh, video visit, for example. Or other uh, demographics or, or, or medical situations where even outside of the pandemic, perhaps, the patient does uh, would prefer not to come in for an in-person visit. Uh, things like sexual health, uh, for example, for men and women where they may be reticent to come in for an uh, in-person visit. So I think there's still lots of, those are just a few examples that come to my mind. I think there's a lot of different, very, niche specific use cases in telehealth that are still out there for um, ripe for innovation from telehealth entrepreneurs using WebRTC live video. The fourth trend here is that uh, remote work is the new work. Uh, for the many companies that were skeptical about a remote workforce, uh, they certainly saw in 2020 they were forced to adapt to that. And now that many of these companies have made those adaptations, both the employers and the employees are seeing some benefit from it, and they're not going to go back. So for companies like, like us at WebRTC Ventures, we've been remote for 10 years. This is very natural to us to work remotely. We have team members all around North and South America. We work with clients globally. It's kind of intuitive to us at this point. We already knew this before the pandemic, but many companies, many professional uh, industries just realized that over the last year that they can do this and they can be effective at it. But now having made that realization and knowing that their employees don't want to come back to the office at least not five days a week, they want to have more of a hybrid situation there. Now they have to think about how can, now that we're getting through the pandemic, how can we improve our work processes, not just with that goal in mind of let's just survive through the pandemic and then everybody's gonna come back to the office because they're not all gonna come back to the office. So now how do we change these workflows so that they will work for the longer term and work well regardless of whether the people in that workflow are at home or at the office or traveling. So. I think there's a lot of opportunities here, but the big warning is that we don't need another meeting tool. So most business processes that are done remotely are, are just meetings, and there are plenty of meeting tools out there already. We don't need to build more meeting tools. I feel like that's, uh, at least it's not very interesting for us to work on as a development company, but I also don't feel like there's a lot of consumer appetite for that, unless you have some sort of a really unique user experience, right? Because while we do have plenty of meeting tools, I certainly understand they're not always very exciting. Um, and there's still some technical challenges in them too, but those are being worked on and improved over time uh, by the bigger players as well. It's not necessarily a, a lot of opportunity for a small startup to come in there. However, if you've got a really unique UI, a different user experience that will make that, that type of collaboration and that meeting better, then uh, there may still be an opportunity there. So one example I, I know of there is uh, jam.app, which has the meeting participants are like floating heads around your screen so you can move them around around the work that you're doing so it's not you know changing windows between your meeting tool and then the document that you're talking about or that you're sharing or things like that so that's a unique ui that uh you know could catch on beyond unless you've got a, a great ux idea though for that meeting tool set aside your meeting tool ideas and instead look for an industry niche that you can serve that yes, they need a meeting tool, but they also, there are other aspects of the workflow process that would benefit from having a tool that makes that workflow work better in a hybrid environment where some people in it are remote and some are in person. So you can think about things like uh, sales enablement. So uh, making sure that the sales team is following the sales process and that they're using the right sales materials and that everything is integrated with the sales 
tools and uh, their sales automation. So building a tool like that and integrating video into it is a way that you can still replace a meeting tool without just building yet another meeting tool. You're adding value to that sales team beyond that. Many, many processes and human resources, uh, I think, could also benefit from that, especially as companies are hiring and retaining talent remotely. Uh, more so than ever. Customer support processes as well, now that many of those customer support reps are going to stay at home instead of coming into a traditional call center environment. So I think those are just a few examples, but whatever industry it is that you're an expert in, there are still many opportunities to do better than just sending out a meeting link, but to actually build video into the tool that drives that video process. And so I think that sort of integration of WebRTC video into a business process is only going to continue to grow in 2021 and uh, continue even after the pandemic as well. Now, when we think about how you're going to build all of these live video applications, there's always been a number of choices between uh, CPASS, a commercial communication platform as a service, or going with an open source media server. There's always been a variety of choices here, but certainly over, over the course of 2020, as the video market uh, grew tremendously due to the pandemic. More people have entered that space, most prominently in 2020, Microsoft and Amazon having entered that with CPaaS APIs that you can use in your application as well, in addition to the other traditional CPaaSs that have been out there for a while, like Twilio and Vonage and Agora, not to mention the many open source projects notably Janus and Jitsi in particular, and, and the 8x8 Jitsi solutions. So there's so many different choices that you have now in how to build your WebRTC application. There's certainly some debate of, have we already reached the point where there's too many choices and there's going to be consolidation in this? And I, I think at some point there will be some consolidation in the CPaaS market, but I don't think 2021 is the year that that's going to happen because the market is still growing so much and there's still so much future opportunity here that there's plenty of room for all of these providers to make a great go of it and, and offer s solutions that are slightly unique. Perhaps the video aspects of them tend to converge towards certain experiences and features, but in the CPaaSs you'll see different uh, certainly uh, cost models that may benefit one type of use case over another. So you may choose your CPaaS based on that or perhaps based on what other features they integrate with, what other messaging and APIs they have beyond the video that are helpful to your use case or looking at going to an open source platform and what are the other sort of specific benefits that that open source platform offers to you. So as these choices grow, we certainly expect in our business at WebRTC Ventures this to be an increasingly important part of our work in helping people just sort through all those choices and figuring out which is the best one for their specific use case. And then finally, last trend here that we're expecting to see in WebRTC application development are more niche products. So this is a little bit of a theme of the other trends that I was discussing too, the idea that there are many major media server players out there already and meeting tools out there and those uh, different vendors in the market are going to solve the most generic problems for us like generic meeting tool issues and funny backgrounds and, and things like that. Instead, we as entrepreneurs need to focus on the different niches that that uh, would benefit from something more custom. And so I think the trend here is not to think about how you can serve the total global population with your application, but what is the very specific niche that you would serve? And sometimes that's going to be a niche driven around uh, particular consumers or particular business workflows, as I talked about in the concept of remote work. Other times it's just going to be a very specific technical need that no one is addressing. And I think an interesting example of that is the uh, broadcaster.vc project uh, in, uh, in beta now as I record this video. That our friends Dan Jenkins and Nimble Ape and Lorenzo Miniero from Meet Echo have put together that's a way for you to connect a WebRTC uh, source as an NDI input into OBS, the popular open source tool for live streaming and, and video editing that I'm using and recording this as well. So that's an example of a very niche solution, a uh, very niche technical need uh, that they saw people uh, needed. 
uh, and, and are addressing. And so looking for those very specific technical niches or customer niches is definitely going to be the key to success with your video application in 2021 because as the as the the pie has grown much bigger in terms of how many people are using video applications during and after the pandemic that means that the biggest use cases are going to be addressed in many cases by bigger players that will be tough for you to compete with but it also opens the opportunity for all these little niches that before there weren't enough people willing to pay for a product in that now there will be because the overall market uh, size is so much larger than in the past so 2020 really was uh, for uh, video applications. It was, a, it, it was a terrible year, but it was also a revolutionary year because consumers and, and global society as a whole were forced to work in different ways. And so it was very revolutionary in terms of people's willingness to do things differently, to do things remotely. And that changes everything in terms of how we look at video application development. And as we leave the pandemic, in 2021 or 2022, we're not going back to the way things were in 2019. So 2021 is not going to be the year that this all ends, unfortunately, from the pandemic perspective, but also it's not going to be the year that this ends from a video application development perspective. This is really a transitional year. This is the year where now that the, the shock has worn off of 2020, in the pandemic and we're learning not only the lessons of last year but also starting to see what trends what things are going to stay with us even after successful deployment of the vaccines means that the pandemic comes to an end many of these lessons that we're learning as a society and technologically are not going to change and so this is the year to really start thinking beyond the pandemic and how the use of video applications in 2022 and beyond uh, is, is going to uh, change, continue to change uh, society. So thinking about and planning your application for that now. And if you've got a idea uh, from some of the experiences that you've had uh, through this pandemic and, and how you see the world changing after this and you wanna build that video application, we'd certainly be happy to help you with the WebRTC Ventures team. Just check us out at webrtc.ventures, follow us on Twitter at webrtcventures, and we'd be happy to apply our expertise in building live video applications to your solution and help you make the future a better place. So let's build that live video application. Thanks for joining me today. I'm Aaron Syme, founder and CEO at WebRTC Ventures.